I'm no more at Bielefeld University. I just started a new position at the Technical University of Darmstadt, where I now have an assistant professor position. Um, OK, that being said, let me start my talk. Um, so I'm going to talk about some yeah, aspects of thermal activation in the switching phenomena that you've heard about today in the morning session and probably are going to hear about during this afternoon as well. Um, actually, my talk is pretty crowded and I will talk about four aspects that we've been working on during the last three years. The thermal activation, um, in the nail order switching of manganese to gold. So this is the oldest story. We also looked at magnetron sputtered copper manganese arsenide thin films. Recently, we looked at the spin hall effect based switching um, of a metallic antiferromagnet, manganese nitride. And finally, I will discuss an ohmic contribution to the electrical readout, the so-called artifact that you may have heard about already. So let's start with the thermal activation in the near order switching of manganese to gold. This is our setup that we use for um, yeah, the actual measurements. Here in the back, uh, you see uh, some switching traces that we recorded. We generate our pulses with an arbitrary waveform generator, and we have a broadband amplifier. Sometimes we need a little bit more voltage than this thing can supply. Um, we measure everything with a lock-in amplifier, so all the measurements of the planar hall effect are done with a lock-in amplifier in this case. And then we have this um, read relay box that does the automatic routing of all the um, current lines uh, along the sample. Um, then this is uh, a breakout box that we use for the actual electrical connections to the sample. Here we have some more auxiliary lock-in amplifiers, some auxiliary voltage and current measurements, and a shunt for the current measurement. Okay, so this is essentially the electrical setup that we use for the experiments. Rather than using just single pulses in our experiment, we use the concept of bursts. Because what we find is when you use a single long pulse, say a millisecond long pulse, you find that the temperature of your film shoots up quite a bit. And to reduce this effect, we chop a single pulse into multiple pulses, which we then call a burst. So we have a pulse duration delta t. Then we have some spacing between the pulses that has some frequency or correspondingly a duty cycle. And then we have this burst. This is basically just a train of pulses that consists of n pulses. Um, Okay, so set that. Um, and what we also impose as a constraint is that we keep the total charge per burst constant so that these bursts are in some sense comparable. And it reduces the number of free parameters that you can play with. Okay, um, we looked at the electrical switching of manganese to gold. Basically, we did this kind of standard experiment, and instead of the eight arm cross devices, we used a four arm device. Um, so here we route the current such that we apply a voltage to two terminals at the same time here and there. This gives you essentially an effective current going this way or that way. And then for the electrical readout with the planar hall effect, we send a probe current this way and measure the planar hall effect along this way. Okay, and when we do that, we do the electrical pulsing experiment. So we pulse along either the red or the black direction. We see that the transverse voltage it's up and down and up and down as we pulse along one or another direction. So this is exactly um, what you've seen already, and we interpret this as a sign for the switching um, of the uh, nail order in the manganese to gold. The current profile looks like this from a final element simulation, and when you um, crank up the current a bit too much, you find destruction of your structure here in the edges exactly where you would expect <coughs> it from this current crowding effect here. Okay, so. Apparently, we see the electrical switching of manganese to gold in our samples. Very good. Now we wanted to understand what's going on there, and now I'm coming to the thermal activation in um, this experiment. Um, we came up with a model where the basic idea is that our film is essentially polycrystalline. Our films are not super high quality epitaxial films. They have a very clear grain structure with grain diameters of, say, 10, 20 nanometers or so. So we think that these grains are monodomain antiferromagnetic grains, and they are essentially uncoupled, because through the grain boundaries, you have essentially no exchange coupling. So we have uncoupled grains, and every single grain switches the magnetization or the nail vector coherently. Then we draw an energy landscape, which is essentially a biaxial energy landscape, 
and has an additional contribution from the nil order spin orbit torque. So it essentially looks like this, where this is the NSOT energy and this um, fourfold thing is the biaxial energy. Then you can compute the corresponding energy barrier. Um, so essentially what is here is uh, something like, okay, I'm in this state and I want to go in this, in, to this state. So what is the height of this energy barrier? This is given by this formula. And the effective field down here is essentially Zeeman field um, which corresponds to this nil order spin over torque field and has one parameter, namely the spin over torque efficiency. The second part of the model is that having the energy barrier, you can compute the switching rate, which is given by the nil Arrhenius equation. And from this, you can compute the corresponding switching probability with this distribution. Then we also take into account the joule heating um, from the pretty large current density that we apply. So the film temperature shoots up and we compute the temperature with this analytical expression taken from this paper. Now we have a bunch of parameters, and most of these parameters, oh sorry, so this is what this formula actually looks like. You have some current density that you switch on and off again, and this is the corresponding delta T profile, so the um, temperature shoots up and comes back down. This is given by this formula down here. Okay, so now we have quite a lot of parameters that we need to know, and luckily we need actually, we actually know most of these parameters, like the grain size distribution that we measure via AFM, um, the cell volume, the NL vector. Um, we take um, the spin orbit torque efficiency from um, an ab initio calculation. We estimate um, the antiferromagnetic resonance frequency simply as 10 to the 12 um, per second. And then we have some geometrical parameters and the uh, conductivity <coughs> of the film. And this is how we compute the transverse resistance. Okay, taking this all together, throwing it into a Monte Carlo code and doing quite elaborate num um, numerical simulations, we get this result. On the left, we have our experimental results for um, the switching as a function of different current densities, of different temperatures, and for different pulse widths. And you see here the comparison to our best numerical results. Um, you see that as a function of current density, um, these results are pretty close, I would say, as a function of temperature. Also, we see that these results match pretty well. The main result here is that as you go to higher temperature, the switching efficiency increases. So you see higher amplitude at higher temperature, which is a very clear sign of a thermally activated process. From these parameters, um, you can now extract the anisotropy energy per grain, which is like 1.5 EV, so pretty stable at room temperature. The corresponding anisotropy energy density is 7.5 micro EV per formula unit. And the thermal stability factor that the MRAM people like is in this case about 60, which means that the thermal stability of the um, electrically set state is very good. Okay, um, the dependence on the pulse width doesn't look so nice. Um, the reason for this is that at some point, the model that we use breaks down because this is a purely two-dimensional model, whereas the actual experiment is obviously three-dimensional. So this is expected that this doesn't work very well. Okay, um, so this is the main result that we find for the manganese 2 gold. It's actually an old story, so I'm going a bit quickly through this to have some more time to talk about our copper manganese arsenide. Okay, so basically we do pretty much the same kind of experiment that, for example, Pete has already talked about um, with the copper manganese arsenide. But the difference is that we do not grow our films with molecular beam epitaxy, and we don't want to have super epitaxial films. What we want to have is a, yeah, a means of yeah, fast preparation of the films, and we do magnetron sputtering simply by using a copper manganese arsenide target, and then we do, yeah, sputtering in an argon atmosphere without very special um, conditions. We only control the pressure and the substrate temperature. And we find that the substrate temperature is pretty crucial. Our magic value is 410 degrees centigrade for the growth. Okay, if you're interested, ask me why this is the magic value. <laughs> okay, um, so we grow a copper magnus arsenide 100 nanometers film on gallium arsenide, and finally we cap this with titanium um, without the capping, it just oxidizes within a few days, so the titanium just protects the film. We find that we um, get nice tetragonal copper manganese arsenide with O1 orientation, um, but from the X-ray reflectivity and the AFM, we see that these films are really, really 
bad in terms of roughness. And also the TEM cross-section tells you that we don't have a nice epitaxial films. Actually, it looks like as if we were stacking little uh, copper manganese arsenide plates on top of one another. And um, the thickness of these plates corresponds exactly to the um, perpendicular grain size measured with the Scherer formula. So this is consistent. Okay, so this is the film quality. But does it hurt the electrical switching? Let's see, we did the experiment naturally. Um, in this case, we used the same geometry that was um, proposed by uh, the Nottingham and Prague group. So with these eight arm devices, so we drive our currents this way or that way and do the probing under 45 degrees rotation. And we get these kinds of switching curves. Here we use one microsecond pulses. And with increasing current density, again, we see that the switching efficiency increases. We see this nice saturation here. And also as a function of pulse width, we see that with longer pulses, we get more switching amplitude. Then we also looked at relaxation. And here we see that these black and red uh, colors encode the switching. So this is always the pulsing phase. We pulse, measure, pulse, measure, pulse, measure. And then we have a phase of relaxation here encoded in blue, where we just measure every second and just look at the planar hall resistance and check what's going on. Okay. So we see this combined switching and relaxation. This is the kind of plot that I'm going to um, show during this talk a few more times. Um, from this kind of plot, we extract a bunch of parameters to not have to look at these graphs. Okay, it zigzags up and down, but can we extract some meaningful parameters from this? <coughs> to do that, we fit some um, analytical expressions. Um, the relaxation part has to be exponential, so we expect an exponential um, relaxation for various theoretical reasons. So um, here we, we fit a sum of two exponentials to get a good fit. And then to this um, first part where we do the switching, um, we also fit a very similar formula, but the parameters have no strict physical meaning. The only reason why we do that is because we want to extract the slope here at the very beginning. When we do this numerically by just taking the numerical derivative of these two points, this is numerically very unstable, and we get much better and smoother results when we just fit something that looks good. Okay, so this is a very stupid empirical fit without a physical meaning, and it just serves the purpose to extract this slope. And the point is that we have an analytical expression for this slope, um, derived from the physical model that I've presented earlier. You can do a linearization and then you can derive this expression up here. And for the decay, we know that this should be exactly um, exponential. And from this exponential decay, we can then extract the energy barrier that is overcome. So the typical experiment looks like this. We go through different temperatures and we see that at higher temperature, the switching becomes more efficient. And then we cross some point at which the switching seems to be um, going down again. So from 260K, you see this maximum. And then at 280K, the switching appears to um, yeah, level off again. So the efficiency here increases, actually, while the amplitude here shows a maximum. And when you look closely, you see that at higher temperature, this relaxation becomes faster. Okay, now with this approach that I've shown earlier, we extract a bunch of parameters, and these are now drawn here. On the left side, we see um, the, uh, the switching efficiency in blue and the switching amplitude as a function of temperature. And you see that this amplitude goes down at too high temperature, while the efficiency, so the slope at the very beginning, still goes up. Um, and then as a function of current density, we see that the switching efficiency um, follows an exponential. And this is exactly what you would expect from the theoretical model. The theoretical model, um, you can rewrite it in a way that you can draw a kind of Arrhenius plot here for the switching efficiency as a function of the inverse temperature. And when you do that, you find that you get exactly a straight line, kind of Arrhenius plot. And also this exponential behavior as a function of the current density is exactly what you expect from the theoretical form of the equations. So this clearly fits. And now we extract from the um, relaxation times that we see as a function of, sorry, as a function of temperature up here, 
From there, we extract with the Neil Arrhenius equation the corresponding energy barriers. And the energy barriers happen to fall on two straight lines. So we have two exponentials with two different relaxation times, obviously. And this corresponds to two different energy barriers. And they happen to be on a straight line that goes exactly through zero. <coughs> so these dashed lines here are fits that go straight through zero. And that means that we switch grains with lower barrier at lower temperature. And the reason for this is that the spin orbit torque efficiency seems to be constant, which is exactly expected from theory in copper manganese arsenide that it should be essentially temperature independent. Um, so this is a kind of, this is a really remarkable result and it was surprising because naively I would have expected, okay, at lower temperature, we would see some crazy behavior like, I don't know, and this is what happened. Um, so this is really the surprising result here. Um, okay, so what I want to tell you here is that size matters. Um, assume we have some grain size distribution that is log normal. Then you can identify essentially three regimes. One regime are unblocked grains. Their grain size is so small that the energy barrier is so small that they basically just reorient their nail vector by thermal activation on a random basis. Then you have a regime of um, switchable grains, which are just blocked at the temperature at which you do the measurement, but with some thermal activation due to, for example, the, um, the, the, the joule heating, you make these switchable, you switch them, and as you switch off the current, you freeze them in. So this is essentially the active part of the distribution. This is the part of the grains that you can actually switch. And then finally, you have um, this tail of not switchable grains where the energy barrier is just too large. The torque is too weak and you just can't switch them. You have to go to higher temperature or ramp up the current and eventually break your device. And this is very similar to what was shown uh, much earlier uh, in exchange bias physics. In exchange bias physics, you see exactly the same kind of behavior where you can explain the thermal dependence of the exchange bias or the temperature dependence of exchange bias and all the field cooling that people typically do by exactly that kind of grain size distribution. So the message here is that the joule heating makes the blocked grain switchable and the switching must be thermally assisted because otherwise long-term retention of the written states is impossible. You see this nicely in the copper manganese arsenide. We always see this decay because um, probably we don't have a lot of not switchable grains that we um, switchable with the, uh, with the additional joule heating. In contrast to manganese to gold where this mechanism works very well as it seems. Okay, now coming to the third part. I think I'm a bit fast, okay? Um, the electrical switching of the nail order in manganese nitride with the spin Hall effect of platinum. So you've heard about the experiment um, with nickel oxide and platinum where you can switch the nail order with the spin Hall effect of the platinum. So we do a very similar experiment here, but um, essentially what we do is we use a metallic polycrystalline antiferromagnet instead of an insulator that is epitaxially grown. So you've seen some of these experiments today already, might see more of them, where um, nickel oxide and iron 203 are shown um, to be switchable via the spin Hall effect of platinum. Um, I'm going to talk about manganese nitride. This is not so well known, so let me spend half a minute on this. It's, um, a material that has essentially the sodium chloride structure, which has a slight tetragonal distortion. It has a nail temperature of about 650 kelvins. We can grow it in form of thin films with a nice O1 orientation. And uh, it is good for spectacularly high exchange bias. So we did experiments with this and achieved 150 millitesla exchange <coughs> bias at room temperature, which is pretty high, I would say. And we also did some experiments with GMR stacks and we are able to demonstrate that this is useful for GMR systems. So if you like to build a cheap sensor without iridium, go for manganese nitride. Okay, but our actual experiment here is the electrical switching of the manganese nitride. So we grow sex like this. We grow um, tantalum buffered um, manganese nitride with a platinum film on top. The important thing here is that both the tantalum and the manganese nitride are very resistive 
and the platinum has much lower resistivity. So that means that in a pulsed experiment, in this case, most of the current is going to flow through the platinum instead of through the manganese nitride or tantalum. We can virtually ignore the currents flowing through manganese nitride and tantalum. So we go again for this eight-armed um, yeah, star-shaped devices that we use already for the copper magnesium arsenide, and we do this kind of switching experiment. Here now the color code is a bit different. Here in the background you see this, uh, these blue and red shaded areas. This corresponds to the pulsing phases and white um, corresponds to the relaxation phases. So here you see that we can switch and relax, switch in the other direction and relax again. We do this for two polarities, so we either drive the currents like this or like this. Um, so we reverse both pulsing polarities and we see that the switching behavior that we see here is independent of the polarity. And um, to get a little bit better data, we finally do an averaging here and only look at the last three cycles after this kind of training phase, which um, we tend to ignore for the moment. Now we look at the electrical switching and look again at the parameters that we extract with a very similar procedure as I've shown before with the copper manganese arsenide. So we get these nice switching traces. Again, we see at higher temperature, we get more efficient switching, more amplitude, but also the decay becomes faster as we go to higher temperature. And as a function of current density, again, we see that at higher current density, the switching becomes much more efficient. Okay, so now we extract a bunch of parameters um, from this uh, temperature dependence, we get these parameters. From the current dependence, we get these parameters. Here we have the maximum amplitude, which peaks. We also did this experiment not only for 9 nanometers films, but also for 6 nanometers films, just for comparison. We also see that it peaks at very similar temperature. The efficiency of the switching, so this initial slope, goes up as a function of temperature. The um, decay time, this uh, time constant, goes down as a function of temperature, and now again, we compute the corresponding energy barriers, and for the two film thicknesses, both of them happen to lie on the same straight line, that again, extrapolates strictly to zero. So again, we see that um, the switching here is very well described by a constant delta. In this case, it's 37.1, so much lower than the value of 60 that we've um, seen for um, the manganese to gold. So currently here, um, the situation is uh, much less stable, and I think the reason for this is that the available spin orbit torque that we have here is just a bit smaller. Okay, let's ignore current density for a moment. More interesting is the grain size analysis here. For this sample, we have, um, or for this type of samples, we have a very accurate grain size analysis from our collaborators um, from Kevin O'Grady's group in York. They did plan view TEM imaging and looked at the grain size distribution in um, this kind of films, you can recompute um, these data um, to a probability distribution of the grain area times the thickness gives you the volume distribution. And they also did an anisotropy analysis via their so-called York protocol by making exchange bias reversal experiments with um, yeah, reversed fields. And from this, they are able to extract the anisotropy constant. And the median um, yeah, exchange, uh, the median energy barrier that you can derive from this analysis is about 0.5 electron volts for the 9 nanometers thick film. And now we look at the energy barrier that we find for our films here, and we see that um, it's slightly larger than 0.5 eV. Okay, so that means that from these two completely independent experiments, we get essentially the same energy barrier, which is nice, so it just fits. And now we can do this assignment of unblocked, switchable, and blocked regimes on a quantitative basis, um, which we did previously on just a qualitative basis. So here we have the unblocked grains, which have grain areas of less than 20 nanometers squared, and we have the switchable regime and this blocked regime, which is basically just this tail down here. So the number of um, completely blocked grains is pretty small in this case. Okay, if you're looking for more details, please ask Mareike, uh, who actually did most of the experimental work on this, and she has a poster up there. Okay, now, for the last five minutes, I want to discuss some omic contributions, or the so-called artifact, um, in the switching experiments that um, yeah, you see in the electrical readout. 
So the experiment that we did is we looked at the switching of niobium films. Well, the niobium film is not an antiferromagnet, it's not a ferromagnet, it's just a simple metal, essentially. We gr we've grown niobium films on MgO01 substrates and covered them with a bit of silicon, and we've grown films at 400 degrees centigrade, high temperature, or at room temperature. Um, the high temperature grown film is nice and epitaxial and has um, in a 110 orientation. The room temperature film is essentially polycrystalline, as you can see here. Again, we use these uh, eight arm devices, do exactly the same kind of experiment, and we see this. Okay, great, we can switch niobium, both for the room temperature film as well as for the high temperature film. But look carefully. In the room temperature grown film, we see up, down, up, down, up, wait, down, up, down, up, down, up. Okay, and for the high temperature grown film, we see down, up, down, up, down, up. Okay, what the heck is going on here? To resolve this question of what's going on there, we did some micro X-ray diffraction experiments. We took our devices to a synchrotron, the ALS in Berkeley, went to beamline 1232, which uh, provides you with um, a uh, lower or monochromatic um, X-ray diffraction geometry um, with a spot size of approximately five microns. So we focused down our, in this case, monochromatic X-rays on different spots of our device, look at some diffraction spots, and then we do the pulsing experiment and just look at the intensities and peak positions on the 2D detector. And what we find here is, okay, the signal is really noisy, but as we collect all our data together, um, we find this. So for the room temperature deposited sample, the polycrystalline one, we see that the intensity of those peaks goes up as we do the pulsing, which means that we recrystallize the material in these, um, yeah, in these narrows of the structure, in the arms. The high temperature grown sample, in contrast, just forms a straight line, and here at the very end, the intensity of one spot drops because we broke the sample. Okay, that's obvious. So the joule heating leads to local annealing in these arms. The local annealing obviously crystallizes the film, and this leads to resistivity reduction. Great. So now let's throw this into FEM simulations and see what happens. So we take this cross and we take essentially everywhere the same resistivity, but we reduce the resistivity in these, yeah, in these arms. In this case, we strictly reduce it and then we send a current along this direction and we look at the equipotential lines and you see that the equipotential lines are distorted in this case and that gives rise to a voltage drop from here to there. Okay, so this is the transverse voltage that we see. The point is, we broke the mirror symmetry with respect to the current direction. No matter what you do, when it breaks <coughs> this mirror symmetry, you immediately get a transverse voltage. And this is exactly the so-called artifact. <coughs> um, we did more experiments and carefully monitored the resistances along this line, along this line. I don't want to go into the details, they're boring. We did a detailed analysis of all the resistances and did FEM modeling and <coughs> ultimately really quantitative agreement with the experiment. So it's not an order of magnitude uh, estimate. We're really exactly at the, at the values that we see when we put in the measured resistances and the changes of the resistances, we really see the measured transverse voltage. So we have a quantitative understanding of what's going on there. Unfortunately, the same effect is also present in the simple cross devices, so these guys don't help you out. Same thing here. Okay, but wait, there were two contributions. Okay, so there is this thing that goes up, down, up, down. Okay, something vanishes, then it goes down, up, down, up. Okay, so we've understood this guy. This is the first part where we have the joule heating that leads to local annealing, that leads to resistivity reduction. When we change the sign, it means we increase the resistivity. Okay, that comes from our high current density and grain boundary electromigration. And that leads apparently to an increase of the resistance and finally to device failure that looks like this, where we see under an SEM where, did, where we also did an inoperandus study, so we pulsed in the SEM and look what happens. And we see that when the device breaks, you see these nice droplets forming here, which go along with the electron flow. Okay, so at some point you just kill the device, but before you do it, 
you apparently locally reduce, sorry, you increase the resistivity locally. Okay, and this is the second component. This is the component that is only present in the high temperature grown film because there is nothing that you could additionally crystallize. It's already crystalline, but you can still kill it via electromigration. Okay, so this fake switching may be superimposed in any AFM switching experiment with this kind of geometry. What you want to do is check the reproducibility because at least the annealing-like component is not reproduc reproducible. It should vanish over time. So when you repeat, 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 it should be gone at some point. Check the pulse line resistances. When these guys change, be skeptical and look for temperature-dependent relaxation because the relaxation is a pretty good sign that actually you're looking at the magnetic system. When you don't see relaxation, be skeptical. Okay, and finally, I would like to acknowledge all the people who contributed to this, my anti-ferromagnetic spintronics group, and also with help from my spin effect group, I would like to thank Professor Reis for uh, yeah, basically allowing me to work in his lab for all very good years. Um, I would like to thank the Beamline scientists from ALS Berkeley and Hubert Ebert for theoretical input, and also uh, I would like to thank the DFG for funding and also the MIWF. And if you're interested, um, visit my website. Currently, it points to the Bielefeld homepage, but hopefully I can soon redirect it to my new homepage at Technical University of Darmstadt. And if you're interested in a PhD or postdoc position and help building up a lab, uh, I will be very happy if you come to me and talk to me. There will be a position soon. <laughs> Thanks for your attention. Much. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have a question about the last part, which I think is super important, and I'm also going to talk about it because uh, there's a lot of stuff that's been published that looks very much like that. Um, we quite often, I mean, see that both effects, you know, occur in samples randomly. The micro sample only shows one effect, or only shows the other effect. Um, not that it does change. Do you have any statistics on is there anything that? This residue reduction occurs more often in thicker or thinner films, or you don't know? No, we did a lot of experiments. We tried many different materials. It's ubiquitous. You okay, see it yeah, no yeah. matter what you put in. Yeah, yeah. Also so, platinum. Yeah, of, of course, platinum as well, but you can also look at vanadium, titanium, you name it. You see it everywhere. It's ubiquitous. And sometimes you see both components, sometimes you see just one component. In the nicely epitaxial grown uh, high temperature films, tend to see only the electromigration contribution, so the destructive contribution. And I call it explicitly destructive because from the FEM simulation, you can fix the sign. You know what the sign is. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. What about what you call fake switching in manganese to gold? <laughs> I knew that question <laughs> would come. Um, I don't know. You said you, Seriously, uh, I... Uh, just before you said that you expect if it's magnetic, you see a decay. Yeah, in the manganese to gold, we think don't see the decay because the temperature at which we switch is very high. Um, I've quickly shown this graph of the film temperature. So apparently it shoots up by 500K during the switching and we freeze the state very quickly. So the switching temperature is way higher than the actual temperature at which we observe. So I think this is the reason why we can switch despite the pretty large energy barrier and still see no relaxation. But honestly, I have no idea whether everything is due to this. We will have to do the experiments again now that we understood what's going on here. This is like a couple of weeks old, okay? I mean, the FEM simulations were done last week, so this is really fresh. And with this understanding, we will have to investigate again <coughs> and check whether these results are correct. It looks so, because the switching traces have some characteristics that you would assign to the magnetic situation. <laughs> Honestly, not so clear. I think the same is true for Matthias samples and other samples. Well, direct imaging, where you see that. Uh, okay, this this is a smoking gun argument. So when you see the I imaging, feel that part of our signal comes exactly from that. But there's at least something magnetic happening. Okay, exactly. So you know something magnetic is happening, but you don't know if all the electrical <laughs> responses due to that. Now, <laughs> smoking gun is if you see uh, polarity emission. Yes. I mean, the and also reverse the... Uh, I think you have a current which blows, I mean, but if you heat up the sample, yeah. I think this should be really happening at this. Okay, you think really electric, you feel... Yeah, yeah, it's 
the electrical diffusion would happen out of these narrows. So in both cases, you would be driving material outwards, increasing the resistivity locally. So I don't think that the polarity dependence is the smoking gun. All right, more questions? Well, actually, I think I'm going to continue to discuss. <laughs> we have five more minutes. <laughs> so, Mark, who is the largest uh, signal that you saw in this Let me put it as delta rho over rho. That's on the order of 10 to the minus 2 in magnitude to gold, if I remember correctly. But no, no, no. Uh, no, in these. You know, possibly that this is uh, the, the, the fake switching. Oh, this can be really huge. It can be ohms, so on a percent scale. When you're burning the sun, when you're in Well, that's the ultimate uh, <laughs> maximum amplitude that you would get, but even before you actually destroy the sample. So we looked at, uh, um, at the destruction here in the, um, in, the, in the SEM, and actually what we wanted to see is whether we can see some kind of electromigration, be it in the secondary electron image or in the backscatter image. Unfortunately, we were not able to really see something meaningful. What we see is that cracks form before ultimately um, the device breaks. So this is the only information that we got from there, and that apparently uh, this is due to the electron flow and not due to the electric field that yeah, destroys the sample. So this is what we're And this is certainly irreversible. That's absolutely true. It's <laughs> moving to this range here. Yes. So I wonder if you see anything like if this goes out of phase or how the three curves relate to each other. So now you cannot really see it because it's <coughs> how does the transition happen? Um, essentially, you have this component here that is always there. And then you have, so let's call it the down-up component, and then you have the up-down component that decays quickly. And at some point, they just sum up to zero, and it reverses. Uh -huh. So there's no out of phase Yeah, well, you can interpret this as a 180 degrees phase yeah. reversal. It's just the sum of two components, one of yeah. which vanishes, and the other is still there. Okay. So there was... Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, so in the first part of the talk, there was a discrepancy between uh, experiments and theory, because the theory was made with some uh, two-dimensional. Yes. Mm -hmm. So my question is, so first of all, why you cannot consider easily a directly three-dimensional model? And then also, why this uh, measure in particular is sensitive to the dimensionality? Okay. Almost there? There. Okay. So the question is, where does this discrepancy come from, whereas these are so nice? Okay? Um, the point is that the formula we use for the simulation of the temperature, which is, wait a minute, it's, I confused myself, okay, which is this one. This is strictly derived for a two-dimensional case. So you take a cross section, you put a two-dimensional, you, you put a wire on top that is infinite in length. Okay, and then you have some nice analytical approach with Green's functions and stuff to get, in the end, this expression. The three-dimensional case is more complicated and very simply, I haven't found a nice analytical solution that I could have thrown into my Monte Carlo code and I didn't want to link it with a three-dimensional FEM simulation. That's the explanation. Okay. The three-dimensional case is different because you have an additional degree of freedom along which your um, temperature or your heat um, can dissipate. And that means that for very short pulses, um, when, when the time scales are such that um, you can still consider the system is essentially a two-dimensional cross-section during where you, where you direct the current through. Um, in this case, you uh, can argue, okay, this formula is probably valid, but at long time scales, you, yeah, at some point this, this three-dimensional heat flow will, uh, will kick in, and uh, this will effectively reduce the temperature. So um, this formula will overestimate the temperature rise, and in the end, it, it predicts too high switching efficiency. So the actual switching efficiency is lower as compared to what this formula predicts due to this temperature rise. So it makes sense, but it's hard to, to model. <coughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thanks again.